it's interesting because you talk about your where you live. I actually have a friend from Novi Sad. I think, I think I, you told I, me. You told me something. I don't know. Like I, or, I mean, maybe did. or maybe they did because I told them you should check this guy out. She lives in Paris, um, and so I was aware of the city. I didn't realize how close it was to Belgrade. Yeah, I guess this is part of the thing that you started, right? People are going to recognize you when you're that active. Yeah, I mean, talking about about Paris. Like I have good good friend over there, Catherine Ferrari Simone, and she actually actually asked me a couple of weeks ago. You know, do you have a community of people that know you in Paris? Like we want to do a meetup. Will anybody come if we invite you? I said I have no idea. <laughs> I need to to check we it can, out. We can try so, and um, we can try and amplify that. Why not? Exactly. I mean, we Why can not? we can come up with something together. That's. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's a good thing. Okay, guys. So we are gathering here today, as we like to say on an event. This is the new episode of Funky Marketing Show. Welcome. We're starting in a non-formal way this time. My guest is Philip Vela, currently coming from Paris, right? You are over there. We're going to talk about positioning, selling, starting, building. How do you actually do that? We were discussing of, you know, what should we talk about? So, uh, and... Philip is somebody who has a lot of experience, you know, in connecting European startups with part-time CMOs, marketing specialists, also connecting a lot of people and working with different teams in a different ways or forms, and a lot of experience in marketing, sales, of course, business development. So kind of an interesting background. He's also venture capital, venture funder, partner, right? At the first cycle capital, VC yeah, firm that invests in Africa fintech, but stop me and tell me a little bit more. What did I say wrong? What did I say right? And what I didn't say. No, uh, you, you, you explained it well. I appreciate the, um, the, the nice intro, like, uh, picking me up in, in terms of my experience. Basically we have a business that started in 2018. That is, um, part-time CMO business. I noticed that you didn't try and say the name of our business, the manager. I was wondering if you could try and say the name of our business. Do you see? Oh, yeah. Let me, let me, let me, let me try to do it. Cause I like to record this myself and see how people say it. Eat, eat, eat Very good. Or yeah, that's perfect. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, yeah. that's perfect. Maybe it's a French thing where people don't know how to say it. Uh, I'm not sure. Maybe who knows? In Serbia, we usually uh, say it as we write it. We we oh, usually perfect. say say Genetic. it like that. Yeah, yeah, perfect. I actually live in Germany now. We started the business in Paris, but I live in Germany now. I I moved here because my wife is German. I forgot, I forgot that. Sorry. <laughs> ah, that's totally fine. That's, you don't need to remember it. Um, as long as I remember it, that's more important. Um, but uh, we don't do a lot of business in Germany yet, but yeah, mainly focused on France, trying to grow outside. We've got, we've had clients in, um, other, other countries across Europe, but we started, um, with my business partner in Paris together. And so that's where most of our network was. And, um, the part-time CMO, however, the people we've hired, the freelancers we've worked with, they've come from everywhere. Because one thing I think that's really important to me about working in Europe is I think that European startup ecosystems don't like kind of meld together enough. They don't help each other enough. And so, you know, what's the most common problem anyone has once they start to grow in their own countries, they need to go outside in Europe much faster than in other places. So that's kind of like one of the things that we wanted to try and help, particularly French startups. France is quite a big ecosystem and it's grown a lot. Like it's grown five times uh, multiple since we started. That's one of the reasons why maybe why we haven't gone too far into other countries yet. The, uh, yeah, the, the, the fact that we don't kind of meld them together is, is a kind of a focus of mine, particularly because I do think that like we could learn a lot from each other by cross-border sharing. And at the end of the day, everyone's trying to grow, you know, within their own countries and then within Europe and usually outside of Europe. Right. So that's what, another reason why we have people from almost everywhere. We've got like, you know, UK, I'm from Australia, Spain, uh, France, obviously, Estonia, German, you know, we've, we've, had, we've got people who, who can talk, speak all these languages, know those cultures and uh, are obviously specialists in their, in their field as well. Yeah. yeah that, that's always a good thing. I mean, they complement each other and they have all uh, Share different info back, and... backgrounds, right? Yeah. Different knowledges. I, I always say, say that like, to get into a perspective where I am at the moment, like I always say to the people, you know, I had a team, we, we got to like seven, eight people at one moment when Funky Marketing was an agency. And then I saw, you know, mm -hmm. I'm going to switch gears 
because they mm -hmm. see that you know companies are hiring us to implement somebody else's strategies and i wanted to be the one to to lead with the strategy and then actually you know do what i what i want to do and work with whomever i want to do because mm -hmm. i've been in the, in the agency game and i don't like it i don't like that mm -hmm. business model so uh i basically scaled down the agency i'm still working with the same people they're just not mm -hmm hired by funky marketing right they are all entrepreneurs having their own companies they are yep. working with different companies as well and yep. uh, and basically you know depending on a project or uh, or a client whatever it is i'm involving them inside it and they all gather different experience but working with different people hmm. you know for you know one is working with in maybe with more b2c companies then it comes here that he has a different perspective the other one is writing for different industry then he comes here he has a different experience mm -hmm. and you know and it's always nice because what i get from the clients is like not many companies actually understood us right when it comes to the content when it comes to those kind of things because usually a lot of what's available on the market mm -hmm. especially when it comes to the content creation implementation those kind of things Mm. are you know people who say i can write anything or i can create content regarding everything but they don't understand that like some industries are different and they changed a lot in the last few years yeah right? so so then when they say okay go ahead write me an article on this thing or create a content on this stuff they they get lost they say what happened with that they say oh I, I need three months to come up with with something for example somebody didn't work in SaaS. You know, they have yep. no idea about the expression, about how things work, about those kind of things. Even, even all of us get, get lost sometimes, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. coming up with different expressions daily. It's, it's a huge ecosystem, which is changing. I mm. want to give you, give kind of a, like intro of where we are now. Like a lot of things are changing, especially in the last few years when it comes to how we buy the the social media and the internet matured and when it comes to the technology is booming all around companies are changing and we have you know traditional industries being digitally transformized with technologies new technologies coming in and companies using those technologies to actually digitalize the the ones that are not in the, in the tech industry and mm -hmm. uh, inside the just tech industry it's as differentiated as it can be from one side you know everybody's building something but on the other side they all look the same they all invest the same technology uh, and they don't know how to differentiate so there's a lot of room for different kind of people with different kind of knowledge and expertise to get in uh, there and actually help those companies mm. I have a theory at the moment that I, I think you might agree with this. We'll see. Maybe we need maybe we need things we don't agree on so we can get a, a good uh, discussion Definitely. going. Um, but to Brand, the, the thing about um, the sudden explosion of AI, like prior to that, we already had a content explosion, right? So um, there's been a content explosion for the past probably, I don't know, 10 years minimum, right? And it just it's gathered momentum. AI has increased that, not in a good way, Definitely not in a good way so far, um, but that will change, right? So there will be better quality coming out of AI. But the one thing it has done is it allowed people to be more efficient, right? So they're pumping more stuff out. And the realization here is that surely that means that brand will become more important, right? Like fully understanding who you are, who you're for, who you're not, what you will and won't do, right? As a business, what you stand for, what you don't stand for, how you talk, all those kind of things. Um, will become more important because we will be absolutely consumed even more than we are now with content. And so when you talk about differentiation, that for me is brand. And that applies to the most boring B2B company you can think of, um, you know, up to really interesting B2C businesses as well, of course. But um, the majority of the startup world these days is heavily funded towards B2B SaaS companies, right? So if they don't have a clear vision of what they stand for and why they exist, I don't care what their technology, I, I think the technology is not going to matter because it's like, as you say, there's so many similarities. There are so, trying to explain half the things that are out there to somebody who should be using it is half, half the battle. But if you can't even get their attention, good luck. Exactly, exactly. I mean, the differentiation brand, yes. Last episode was with, with, the, with Steve Watt from Seismic and we talked exactly about those things. It's nice how those 
Yeah, I can't do like that. This, it comes well, up. It doesn't do it for some reason. There's one like, do this one. If you do that one, apparently, I think you get balloons, don't you? If you do that. Let's see. I don't know. Like, ah, <laughs> for the, <laughs> those who are listening, we are just playing games here. With, uh, <laughs> with everything. But anyway, I agree on that part. And, you know, the key to everything is, you said, getting to know yourself. And the other thing is getting to know your customers. Right from that perspective, and I think a lot of people don't do either. Right, you can just do one and do okay. If you do both, you are halfway to winning. Because yeah. you know what I see a lot of companies and a lot of not only companies but people trying to be somebody else, right? And that's harder than trying to be yourself, right? From from that perspective, and you know, uh, no, I say it wrong. Okay. Anyway, uh, I got a question for you actually on this. So, like, I had this um debate with someone the other day. Do you? Because you're a big LinkedIn guy, right? You're you're a big LinkedIn yeah. guy. You use it T a lot. Turn out you, to be that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But like, I know it's not. Uh, that's kind of the function rather than the reason you do it, right? The reason you do it is because you you're you're big on demand generation. Um, you think that this, as you talked about, social selling and stuff like that. Do you think that if I'm a B two B SaaS founder right now? Because that's like, I keep saying, that's the majority of people. And I know you talk, you do, deal with a lot of them as well. Do you think if you're a B2B SaaS founder, you have to be very active on LinkedIn? Like, is there no choice? What's your take on that? Um, and it's linked to what you said about you know yourself, by the way. Because I have a theory about this as well. Theories about yeah, it. Yeah, uh, there, is, there is one thing be, before before I answer, and it is content creation creating content is the thing that will get you the biggest roi in go-to-market strategy for the big companies at the moment and that's a fact you yep. cannot do anything that is more effective than that now especially in tech companies we have a lot of people who are introverts we have a yep. lot of people who uh you know never created content we have a yep. lot of people especially on the c-level positions who are engineers Yep. So they're thinking in a different way. They solve problems. We are not creators from, from that side. Mm -hmm. And so you need to see who is actually over there. You know, uh, what I like to say is the, the CEO of subject matter expert. If yes. yes, for sure. We need to amplify what that guy knows. We need to in, to incorporate him in the, inside the communities, on social, wherever we can. Get him in the mm -hmm. conversations with, with the customers, with the peers, everybody. But if that's somebody who just a good manager, you know, and maybe he's, if you add to it, that he or she is an introvert, you know, maybe it's not a good person to be out there. Sure, we can get like marketing team, we can get sales team from that mm -hmm. perspective, mm -hmm. but we'll have the CEO interact in a different context. Mm -hmm. uh, what I like to do in, in those kind of situations when the, the CEO is not somebody who likes to, you know, uh, who is not ongoing and not, doesn't like to doesn't look good, feels good on video, mm. uh, which is the, the number one content oh, like you, you and me. Create, create now. Oh, like you and me. Look how good we look on video, right? Exactly. <laughs> and and the, the thing is, uh, related to that, I mean, I always say interact with people in the, co in, in the comments, you know, with people right. from your industry, with your target people. Because yeah, yeah. Like as, a, as a CEO, your job is to set up the vision of the company. And you need to get it from two sides, not only from your employees, but all, but also from the customers directly, and if mm -hmm. they are on LinkedIn, mm -hmm. it's a no-brainer that you should be there uh, at least consuming, right? Mm -hmm. Engaging is the next step that will help you out because a lot of people out there don't realize the the connection between the revenue and what you do on social, what you do on LinkedIn. They understand that they need to be present, mm -hmm. right? But they don't see how it can help their business grow. Mm -hmm. So. If they get that, if they start feeling that, then it changes a little bit by bit and then it goes. But there are a lot of different people and it will be, I had an episode talking about YouTube SEO. Like, I think YouTube will become the next big thing when it comes to search because Google will is becoming something like AI chat or whatever mm. it is, which will always give you the answers. But on YouTube, you still have a chance to stand out, right? And it's not only educational stuff which a lot of companies now produce. You need to be entertaining as well. And that's something a lot of IT companies cannot do. 
Right. I mean, sure, we, we can we can talk like this. We have a good audio, but we need to have like, I don't know, we need to be in a in a limo, naked girls pouring us champagne, and we still talk about business. That can be one thing, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, but you need to you see how, how many things you need to uh, yeah, yeah, you, you need know, to add the personality and layers to it, right? Yeah, 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 you're right. You, that's a super good point about the comments, actually, because like my um my thing about uh, LinkedIn is like I think it's I don't think it's necessary in the same way because of what you said about people. So the vision of a company, if, you, if you're the, the founder, let's just talk about one, not co-founders or anything like that. Let's talk about one. If you're the founder and you're somebody who does come from the backgrounds you talk about and you are, as you say, possibly introverted, right? And don't feel comfortable being visible. That's the other thing, right? It's not just about mm -hmm. being uh, talking in a room. It's about actually being visible and putting yourself into a position to where people can say things about it. If you're not comfortable with that, my advice is usually, okay, fine, don't do it. Right, go and but you have to find somewhere, some channel that you can find the people that could be your customers, right? And that, you know, I think if you do that, then eventually you'll find yourself to other channels. And similar to what you said, I think I'll add now to people. I'm going to take your piece of advice. I'm going to steal that, and I'm going to say, yeah, do the comments because you're right. That's that's a way for them to interact, but start slowly and then get more comfortable with how they represent themselves. So just to kind of finish my point, it's like. It, are you a redditor there's a there's a reddit uh for everything right so start with reddit okay just do that and do it like do it like you're trying to find people but don't sell to them just find them to talk to understand what they need start with that right if you're some people are no good on social but they're actually really good in a room right they actually can network fairly well right um it's come to if a founder can't sell at least one of them right you can't hire a salespeople a person at the beginning it's impossible they have founding team that can sell if a founder is an yeah. engineer who can sell and sell themselves gold absolute gold right so if you're able to get over the hump of selling you should be able to get over the hump of kind of interacting with people and finding uh, business in other ways than just i don't know cold calling or whatever the hell you end up doing as a, as a salesperson so that was why I, uh, I wanted to know if you think it's absolutely necessary yeah i mean there there's a uh, i think we'll have him a little bit of network Wi-Fi problems, but I think it's going to come down. Yeah. German okay, Wi-Fi. We, probably. Who knows? I mean, it's always the Germans. <laughs> sure. Sorry, Germans. Uh, I mean, I'm from Serbia. I, I'm from Serbia. I can talk like that. <laughs> I'm married to a German. <laughs> there, there, is, there is one thing that I want to add. Like, I always said to the founders, like, if you can do one thing there are two things that two possibilities one is i can get an hour of your time as somebody yep. who, who works with you for you when it comes to marketing yep. and i can prepare a set of questions and ask you questions and you can answer for half an hour or an hour a month it doesn't even have to be weekly right but you need to give me in-depth answers to those things that should be the person who knows which questions to ask. That's mm. essential for that. Mm. And then, you know, if they are not comfortable on video, okay, I'll just use the transcript and I'll create uh, the written post out of it or something else. Mm. But there's also a thing which I recommend to the founders, start a Substack uh, newsletter or Medium or whatever it is. And write, find something. Yeah, write every week uh, uh, a few sentences. It doesn't have to be like every day. Sure, if you can do it a couple of times a week, perfect. I mean, that's also a bad way to writing a book one day, right? I give them like the bigger picture. You can even do that if you do it like this. And they, one by one, they go ahead and do it. I had a chance a couple of times to start working with, with startups where like, I don't know what should be the content for each member of the team because we have like, CTO, we have CPO, we have the founder, we have the analytics guy, we have the marketing guy, we have the, the head of content. And now, okay, majority of them knows what they're doing, what they should talk about. But when it comes to like the founder, I need to, you know, get the insights from somewhere, you know, and then he tells me, I actually have something nobody knows about it. I open up a sub stack where I talk about the things related to life, the books I read, the, the different kind of stuff. 
in one way or the other related to the business. And I said, you know, why don't you share that somebody somewhere else? Yeah. Like he has written at that point, it was like 31, 33 posts, right? And he's writing frequently. And I'm like, nobody knows about it. Nobody knows it's him even, you know, he, he's the guy from Turkey, you know, and he did, doesn't even share it. Maybe he shares it in, uh, you know, to, to the Turkey audience, but they don't know English. Yes. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of goes, goes uh, in, in a cycle and it's, you just need to dig and find out what they are passionate about and they, they, they yeah. invest time in it. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, um, the, I wanted to, um, come back to something else you said about agency working in an agency. Cause it's like, um, it's really interesting. Like we, we said from the beginning of our business that we're not an agency, we're not a consultancy, we're part-time CMOs. And that was really important. And the reason for that is we didn't want to be seen as an agency that does this thing. Uh, we didn't want to be seen as a consultancy that leaves a deck and just walks away. There you go. There's your, there's your strategy. Uh, and you talked about you were doing execution and you wanted to do more strategy. And that's kind of why I, I think why our um, positioning is so clear to us as a part-time CMO, because it's like a part-time CMO in, in or, sorry, a CMO in an early stage business, because that's who we focus on, right? You have to work out, you have to get your hands, deep, you have to build a strategy out of that, and then you have to hire people. And so that's why we're, that's the kind of position that we're trying to fill. But a lot of people still say, well, you're still a consultancy or you're still an agency. It's like, I don't really see it that way because I'm not giving you a person. I'm giving you a person with everyone behind them. I'm giving you uh, lots of knowledge, everyone else they interact with, all the things we've ever built before that they can just pull off the shelf. You know, all of that is more valuable than just going and giving you a person and saying, you know, good luck. But it's an, it's, it was a kind of a new thing when we started and now you see more and more fractional this fractional that and i don't know if you you don't you don't use that term do you, you don't talk about yourself as a fractional cmo or do you yeah i mean yeah fractional cmo is one of the the four packages that i have when okay. it comes to the okay. services right yeah. but uh you know i usually say like a founder and a strategist because that's what I do most of the times. And, mm -hmm. you know, when I even had a team, they, they told me like, why don't you write like strategies on your profile? That's just like, okay, maybe I can, I can say that. And, and I was like, I'm too young to be named as a strategist and work on this level. No, no, no. I, I'm, I'm saying like, okay, so I'm 39. Usually when you look at consultants, yeah, yeah. You know, they're, they're usually people who are at least 10 years older than me, mm -hmm. you know, even, even, even more, all depends. But, but I always say to the people, I was, I was lucky talking about positioning and this kind of things. I was mm -hmm. lucky that I had a background, which is in B2C, not formal education, NGO yep. activism. Yep. Yep. And when I got to the B2B, it, it was only because I talked to 260, 70 people in two months when I left the agency mm -hmm. and I saw the gap that I can fill in, right? I, I didn't know the B2B. So, and after that, what I did is I got the first, my first client was the Impact Hub Belgrade. And basically I was in charge of helping the early stage startups get into the pre-acceleration program. Okay. And I was doing the advertising and working with them and those kind of things. So I was able to prove my hypothesis, you know, it's all in my head or not. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. it started the movement on LinkedIn and everywhere, like lead generation to demand generation. Uh, Chris Walker started to, to pop up uh, and, you know, those kind of things. Uh, and I kind of said, okay, so it's obviously that some things are happening. Not many people are seeing that. Mm. For some reason, I saw it. And mm. then to get it back to the, to the being a consultant, being too young mm. or those kind of things, mm. I told them I cannot be like, a business consultant. I still don't understand like huge corporations and those kind of things. I haven't worked in one of them, right? Yeah, I've in inside businesses in yeah. smaller ones, different sizes, but, but I understand where B2B marketing is going. That part I understand. And that is the part that I understand much better than anybody else, especially here, like on the Balkans, mm -hmm. when you talk about it and I can go ahead and, and help you out in that way. And I needed to prove first to me that, you know, I have enough experience to do it. So I started this podcast, mm -hmm. right? The first 10, 15 guests, I, I asked them, what's their experience? How did they grow up? Where did they work? Those kind yeah. of things. Yeah. Then I saw, okay, I have 
even more experienced than some of them, or at least we are on the same level. So I said, okay, we can discuss. And then it turned out into something where we go ahead on the topic and we discuss it. And it helped me actually get to the US market. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Cause it's hard. I don't know if you had also those things. That's also a question for you afterwards. Yeah. Like getting into the US market, everybody asks you to, to give, give them the experience to connect them with companies that you work with and they want it to be startup, for example, at the same level in the same industry, even in the same niche from the U S not right, from okay. the Europe or anywhere else. Cause they only look Americans look at America, right? From that point. But when we yeah. get to the, to the podcast and we talk, they see if I know things, if I don't, those kind of things. Yeah. But the, the, Breaking point was when I, when I actually asked them, they came to me inbound for example, that was one, one company, everything was great. I sent them the plan and how it goes and everything. And they say, can you connect us with the customers, with, with the companies that you worked with before we want, we want to talk with them. Mm-hmm. And I was like, in Europe, nobody's asking you that, especially here in the park. So oh, they yeah. came to you inbound, right? They recognize okay. you as yeah, a yeah. leader. Oh uh, yeah, usually, they came inbound. They why they yeah yeah why they asking yeah okay it's yeah yeah so so I asked them what do you want to talk with with them and mm. they say it's not make or break right right as you would assume right away right it's yeah. like we recognize you as somebody we want to work with we recognize funky marketing as a company we want to work with mm. but we want to adjust as fast as possible to start working with you. Mm-hmm. So to be able to do that, we need to speak with different companies that you work with so mm-hmm. we can learn how did they adjust to working with you. And, and, you know, what I would say, you know, instantly is you don't have to talk with them. I will tell you what you need to do, right? I have a plan. You will see everything. Does it work? What are the steps? So, of course, they want to hear it from somebody else. Right. Okay. Know, that's how it is. I even have recorded those things because I, after I heard that, I ask other people existing, uh, the ex clients, can you record me a video regarding that part, especially? And they did, right. but they said, no, you want to get them on a the call, right? To, to, to ask them those things, videos didn't work, but okay. what I did yeah. kind of, that, that might be interesting for the, for the listeners. Mm. I send them an email. And I included like five or six different companies, depending on the industry of the potential client that I have. Right. And I said, Hey guys, like Katie wants to talk to the the companies I've been working with, connecting you uh, with her, Mm. feel free to to tell you something about the way we work together. And if you are free, let her know that you can jump on a call. Mm -hmm. She didn't jump on a call. They all got one second, third one. They, they reply to each email and they say, I don't mind sending this publicly to everybody that's in CC. The other one say, Hey, I'm going to go from there and take it to the next level. I'm going to go and take it to the next level. And everybody finished the email with Katie. If you want us to jump on a call to tell you more, we're available. Right. So we didn't end up on the call, but we ended working together. You know, she, she didn't get those people she, on a call. She got what her. she needed, but she didn't need, she didn't have the call in the end. Exactly. Um, it's interesting. That's actually super interesting that you say that doesn't happen to you. So you're saying in the Balkans, people don't ask to, to speak to people you've worked with before. No, no. If, if they come inbound, definitely. Yeah, yeah, true. It's a happens. difference. It's definitely a difference if they come inbound. Right. But if they, if you, if you found them, they do. Yeah. Usually they, they do. Yeah. I mean, I told you Americans are a little bit different, you know? So. Yeah, absolutely. So we, so first thing we, I've done one job in the U S in the time that I've been, that we've had the company. Right. So I worked I'm from Australia. I moved to London. I lit, worked in London for four years in jobs, normal jobs. And I worked for two American companies. Then when I got to Paris, I started freelancing. So since then that's 2016. I've had one American client, right? And that worked out fine. It was a small, no, it's like a couple of months job um, to help them with some gross tactics. But I found them kind of through somebody. Um, it wasn't a direct one. And actually when anyone ever asked me, it's like, oh, you know, if your business seems to be doing well. Um, do you want to go to the US? My answer is always no. So in terms of, uh, in terms of um, potential clients, the primary reason for that is, is that, 
our positioning is for filling a gap of um, skills and level not to do a certain like uh, task, like not to do growth, not to do, we do do those things. I'm not saying we don't, but that's not our positioning. And so the US is very different. And one of the advantages of Europe for a part-time CMO is if you're trying to find a person in your company, from the moment you realize you need that person in most European countries because of the way hiring works, it's six months before they start, right? So in France, it's like three months of um, notice before someone can start a new job. And that's the case in Spain, Germany, Denmark, you know, all through Western Europe. It's not the case in the UK. It's another reason why we haven't put too much effort into the UK. So just positioning wise, if someone needs a CMO or a senior marketer or a person to lead a team or a person to start, it's going to take him, you know, minimum three months to find somebody and probably more like four. So that's one reason why we never went to the US, right? Second point is about the, the validation. Uh, it doesn't surprise me, but I, I have noticed that it became more and more frequent in france as well so i don't know if as 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 things become bigger people become more i don't know reluctant to trust or something i don't really i don't know but it's weird that they would ask for it after an inbound that is weird yeah yeah, there is there is there is one thing kind of interesting uh and i think all of us like underestimate our ability you know, create relationships with the client, with the companies that we actually helped, right? We w- don't want to bother them to jump on a call with, with each client. With us. But when you ask them, I'm sure right. if you deliver the great work, they will always gladly jump on a call in a message, whatever it is, to say a few good words about Anyone you. that asks, like anyone that has asked us, whether it's inbound or not, has ha- I've never had a problem with connecting them with um, with people. I mean, I've probably had certain people that I've given to the to, to multiple clients, um, partially because of the nature of their business. Like, obviously, the bigger and more successful ones that you've worked with, you want to say, "Hey, I worked with these guys. Look at," and you know, if you've built a relationship with that person, that they will do it. And it's been, um, it's definitely been the case. I think. Um, we were going to talk about like uh, how to how to uh, how do people find business as a freelancer or, or as a business like ours, right? But I think one thing I don't know about you, but one thing we all suffer from is that um, is uh, getting that feedback from them once a job is finished, um, making it something that's very kind of industrialized, like you know, send them the form on the day, get the get the um, the 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 content together, you know, make sure their answers are correct, ask them if they'll record a video, like you said. Usually what happens is we go, ah, we haven't had any of those for a while or the ones that we have are kind of a year old, we better go and get some and then we go and try and fill the, fill the gap. But actually what would be good and what we try to do from the beginning is we have a process for when we onboard. Love and I that. think what we don't do is we don't do a very good process when we offboard. We're kind of like jobs done and then we're trying to move on to the, the next one. And especially with people, when you're trying to staff jobs, like when you've got somebody who's about to finish the job, you move them quickly on to the next one because they need to to kind of work with the next client because you've lined it up usually for us. But what we don't do here is kind of get that, hey, can you fill in this form? Can you do this video? Can you, can you give us this feedback? And I think that's something that if you can build it into your processes from the beginning, you, you, you will be very, very happy um, as you grow. The sooner you get that, you get that in there, definitely. Yeah, I, I, to- I totally agree. I mean, asking existing and ex-clients to kind of record a video and talk about these things like i find out the things that i didn't even know right with a company <laughs> i work with them for like two years help them with all kind of different things during during those three years and in the video where the he's now i don't know the, the main partner he's not the ceo his wife is the, C, the ceo but mm-hmm. he recorded the video in which he said Nemanja and Funky Marketing help us grow twofold in two years. And I'm like, I didn't even realize that, right? So, I mean, that's, that's the video. It's in my feature section on the profile. But, you know, those kind of things happen a lot. And as I see Scott said on LinkedIn, LinkedIn is actually passive. We have like more than 10 people, 11 watching and listening. So, hi, guys. So Americans are different. I mean... <laughs> and I just want, want to want to get back uh, to that with one single thing. Like, it's actually why are the U.S. companies asking for experience working with U.S. companies? Like, if you look mm. at the size of a company in the early stage in Europe and in the U.S., 
it's totally different game. And if you look at any size of the company, it's totally different game. In US, mm -hmm. you have more um, funds available. You are growing mm -hmm. faster. People think about marketing in a different way. You don't have GP, GDPR, those kind of things. I mean, it's actually yeah. harder to, to work in Europe regarding those kind of yeah, things. Yeah, yeah, it's true. But, but it's all affecting that you have a much structured company with all more defined specialized roles. Mm. And then what company is looking for and the way they are working with people from outside with agencies, it is a little bit different. Mm. Mm. It's also like what I was saying before about hiring, it's kind of the reverse of that in the US where like they can hire and fire really quickly. Yeah. Um, and they can do the same usually with their suppliers, right? Like supplier contracts are usually, uh, it's a very competitive landscape. So supplier contracts don't have a lot of uh, flexibility for the supplier. And, uh, you know, they're, they're quite, they can be quite demanding. Um, I went to an event recently uh, run by VC in Paris and uh, they had these three guys on stage, none of whom were American. I think two were German, one was French, but they were talking about, they ended up talking a lot about working in the American market because they all had. They'd been mainly uh, commercial guys as well, completely different industries. One was in the recording industry, like music industry. Um, one was, uh, you know, so software sales, but it's super interesting to have that diversity of opinion talking about the US. And one of them said something I'd never considered before. Um, I thought this was more the case in the UK, but he, he talked about the US. He said, They'll, you'll be in a room and everyone will tell you like how great your, your product is and when you're selling and how amazing everything is and, the, and they love it. Don't believe them because in the US, he said, unless they sign, until they sign, don't believe anything they say. And I was comparing it to the UK where people do that in general working life where they tell you everything's good and then they walk around and they're like, well, I don't really care. Um, that's called British politeness, but it's not the same when it comes to signing a deal. And, and I'd never considered that about the US that it's true. It's not even the bluster or the happiness with your work or your, what you're offering them to begin with. It's the fact that nothing matters there except for the results and the deal. Um, and I think we're more like we, we leave a meeting and we kind of go, I think that we're, they're probably going to, they'll probably sign that. You know, you can, you can kind of feel it across in anywhere in Europe. I've never, I've never had a meeting where I thought they were definitely going to sign and then they haven't. I don't think I've ever had that in my time in Europe. But the, in the US, uh, it's just different. I, yeah, I had a lot of situations, like especially in the early days working with the automotive industry where there are a lot of millionaires who actually, you know, open the auto repair shops, those kind of things. They want the results immediately. Right. And he will talk with you like, hey, man, like what's happening over there in, in Serbia? How are you doing? The weather is nice, you know, but if after redoing the website, you are not a step up, not even in the same position mm -hmm. after a day, mm -hmm. he will say, go ahead. I'm going to back to the to the previous to the previous vendor because they mm -hmm. all want results immediately. And it's the industry when you want like to be in the top three places in Google search, especially in Google Maps, because the fourth one doesn't get anything because people uh, search when they drive, right? Mm -hmm. and, and it's kind of, <laughs> kind of insane. Yeah, yeah, but on, yeah. on the other hand, like I had problems when we already talk about this stuff. I had problems working with, with people from Switzerland, for example. Oh, yeah? Us in Serbia are direct and honest. Usually Same in Australia, my English friend. Same is, in Australia. Yeah, yeah, yeah the, the, the English is quite good. <clears throat> so like... We are the good fit with, with the US companies. But when it comes to Switzerland, mm. they don't want anything directly. No matter what's the feedback, they don't give you the feedback directly. They don't want to get it directly. Okay. If you tell them directly, they think you are arrogant. No matter mm -hmm. if it's if you are paid for that and you are doing it with one on one in the email. Mm. Right? I, I had few of those situations. Because, mm. like, and I'm always. The thing that I had at the time working with even Dimitrievich, I don't know if you know him from LinkedIn, was working with me at the time. And he were basically the same person, you know, even born on the same day. He's a little, little bit older, but I, I'm always open and direct in the email when I need mm -hmm. to get, give, give the feedback. Yeah. And so I ask the, the person who is the closest to me, like, did they go over the board or, or do they need yeah. to lower the tone? And he's like, as he is like basically, you know, person born on the same day as me, he said, I would go even harder. <laughs> no, yeah. that's what makes it, you know, liberal. so they always like to go, you need to learn the nuances of each country, nation, however yeah. we call it, 
so, so you know how to adjust your communication. But this is one of the shames of uh, of of that I'm talking about before with uh, with the EU that 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 there isn't more um, mixing of the ecosystems, right? Like I, I'm cool with I'm cool with on like you have to be able to understand what's going on locally. You have to kind of read the room. You have to read the room no matter where you are. But um, uh, that kind of local knowledge, you need someone who knows that and kind of can just, because once you know that, you can you can alter your um, your behavior um, accordingly. And so that's why I said we have people from, from everywhere to try and understand this thing. I always talk about the fact that um, uh, translation is not localization. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. You, can't, you can't just translate the word and go, "Oh, it works." It's like, um, in fact, uh, I have an Italian client, and, and I just remembered that actually they asked me a question about this this wording of something today, right? So I think people who aren't English speaking first are aware of maybe that there would be some issues with that, and going in the opposite direction could be more problematic because you might speak the language, but if you haven't, if you don't nuances of the of the culture, it's going to be a problem. But um, yeah, that's why I think I, I really think Europe's got to kind of get together and get over itself a little bit and merge a little bit of these uh, different places. I think it'd be cool to have. I, I see you're doing that, right? Like you're you you you're visiting places around your region at the very least, and I know you're working with people across the region. And I have the same conversation with people in Germany. I live in Germany and I work in France mainly, and like the fact that the Germans and the French don't do that much together in their startup ecosystem is crazy to me. It's three hours for me on a train to Paris from here. I'm just across the border, and yet, yet no one that I'm aware. Of, I work in. I live in Stuttgart. So you talked about the automotive industry before, right? That's all there is here, and I'm I'm amazed that there's not more kind of Parisian investors kind of looking at stuff here because there's so many skills. You know, there's so much kind of going on here at a very low level, though, right? Because it's if it's not funded by the big automotive country companies, it doesn't happen. And yet in France, they'll throw money at anything just because it's French. That kind of stuff to me, I think, has got to, got to change. I, I, I got to tell you, we need to start working something, doing something together because the company that I mentioned that grew twofold, right? They're yeah. called Cyclopia. And you know what they do? No. Translation and localization. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. And, and there, there was a... There was a comment from Scott uh, on LinkedIn saying that AI has revolutionized the, the way people go to markets uh, in different countries. And that's true. Like Cyclopia, the company that I mentioned, they're including people and mm. technology together to change the way they translate, they do the localization, they do different stuff. And it is actually, actually happening. I mean, I, I saw it because they were working with uh, translating Facebook for Macedonia. Okay. And, you know, and involving all uh, all those different things to kind of help uh, a person, which is a translation, a translator, do the better work, mm -hmm. right, for, for, from that side. And a lot of examples of how you can do that, how you can go to those things. But it's not only about, as we say, about the way we communicate, the way we talk. It's also about how those people behave. How the, is the the you know the society structure and and all those those other things? Tell me how much time do you have? Me? Mm -hmm. yeah, how much time do you want, my friend? <laughs> all good, all good. So we can go for for a, a little bit more. Yeah, let's go for another another fifteen. Is fine if you want. Yeah, absolutely. If you got, if we have more, uh, I'm sure we have many more things to talk about. Come on, we, <laughs> we can keep going. We haven't even talked about the things that we've debated online, you and me, like uh, B 2 C versus B 2 B. That was a that was a that was a big one. Yeah, that's that? that's always that's always kind of an interesting things. And and to be honest, I'm always going forward and backwards when it comes to those kind of things because somebody says. It's it's people in B two C and B two B, and you go say, okay, that's the truth. But then, then you have uh, then you then they basically equalize the B two C and B two B, and then you go and say, okay, but it's not equal and it's not the same. It's definitely not. May I uh, explain myself further? Because I because you know what's interesting is it's kind of like when you talked about the Americans before, and you said they want somebody who's done X Y Z. That's actually where my frustration comes from. If I had, I think as P2 
people in our position, we're talking to clients and they're telling us their problems and we've been doing this for a while and we start to kind of, the wheels start to turn, right? And we can now do it fairly quickly where we can break down their problem. Not perfectly, because we need more information usually. If you're not asking questions in marketing or you think you've got the answer to everything, you're lying, basically. So in that conversation, in those early conversations, we can usually work out like what would be the best fit for them in terms of skills, right? And then if you're um, doing it on behalf of your business, you know who you've got in your team and you know maybe your wider network because I think I didn't say uh, while we've been live that um, you know we work with freelancers and we have our uh, employees. So I've got a fairly large network of, of, of people and skills I can get into. But when somebody says like, I want this specific thing, like I want a French speaking um, dwarf who lives in Lyon and knows only B2B SaaS and has done, you know, uh, Facebook ads on the moon. It's like, no, because that doesn't exist. So what we're going to do is we're going to find the person that best matches. And usually what I'm telling them is I've worked with this person before. This person knows what they're doing. They do a very, very good job. And if there's anything missing in that gap, that's my job to help fill it. That's where I get frustrated. So like, I think when it comes to particularly like growth tactics, I think if someone has been doing growth and I, by that, I mean, acquisition paid acquisition on B to C, I'd rather work with someone who's done that at volume than most, not most, that's not fair, than many B2B growth marketers. And the reason for that is, is they've just done things at a different level and they've had to find like more finite um, optimizations and, you know, they've worked with bigger budgets and all that kind of stuff. That's where I get frustrated about it. Because I think, yes, B2B, knowing, understanding um, what you're selling with, uh, with uh, B2B businesses is important. But if it's like, I need this thing, I'm going to get the person with the best skills, right? And then mm -hmm. I'm going to make sure that I help manage the, the process of the things that matter on top of that. That's, that's my position. Yeah, I always say, you know, there are, to use TikTok as an example, right? A lot of people, a lot of companies now think, you know, we should go on TikTok. Not only B two B. I'm talking in general, but yep. and they are older people, right? Who who don't feel comfortable, you know, making jokes or making funny of themselves or whatever it is. Like serious business people, right? Mm -hmm. They are like, how can I create? With, I cannot do those things that I'm seeing on TikTok. You know, kind of and actually, you don't you, you don't need to do that. Mm -hmm. You know what? All I always say like, there's always somebody who knows how to do it. You can go, especially TikTok, especially the, the new social media that is coming. Look, like youngsters are doing it. They are native on that. Mm -hmm. And they are growing faster because it's it's natural to them to create that kind of content, to act like that, to communicate like that, all those kind of things. But they don't understand what are they doing. They don't understand the steps, right? They don't know that, you know, aha, uh -huh, you implemented some kind of strategy over there. Or there are certain steps that you took to kind of get to, I don't know, 3 million views. Mm -hmm. But you, as somebody who knows the strategy, understands the way platforms work, from mm -hmm. that moment, you can come in and you can explain to that person what did they do. So they can understand, aha, this is actually what, what I did. So when they understand that, they can replicate it for you, right, for, from, that, from that standpoint. And, and this is mm -hmm. something that not many companies as you are utilizing from that perspective. But also there, you know, like we, we mentioned the, the example B2B SaaS and then restaurants, right? Somebody who managed social for the restaurants and did it quite well, build the community. Like, I'm sure that that person can also do something for the B2B tech company if you allow them and give them all the resources and insights that yeah. they need. Not like straight away. It's not like, oh, you're good at Instagram. That's amazing. Come and do this for tomorrow. No, it's not going to work. Of course not. Um, plus, you know, in the case of, I mean, that's probably one of the biggest differences between B2C and B2B is the fact that like, you got to be able to tell a story, but when it's something that's consumer based, it's much easier to tell a story because like, you know, who you're talking to without too much research, you have a rough idea. Um, when it comes to most B2B businesses, you've got to really understand them. You've got to, um, you've got to, as you say, you've got to have a much kind of uh, clearer strategy. 
should never go out without one anyway. But um, but when it, you know, it, you could have somebody who just worked in the restaurant, who who's worked there for a while and has an Instagram, and they could get good at it. Absolutely. Um, but then transferring that to something else, yeah, it's difficult. They have to work out what were the structures that they put in place. They have to kind of back um, fill their 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 learning in a way. But that's the difference between that's one of the biggest differences between B two C and B two B. It is easier in a way to have somebody do something that is more sort of I'm looking for like more um, tangible to people than trying to think of the most boring software I've ever worked on cold storage for large corporations such as health and stuff like that you're going to tell a story about that you got to you got to really work at it right yeah I, I remember when it was my first time working as, as an agency then I became the GM of the agency in like no time it was in 30 months so it kind of kind of kind of fast but all my teammates at the time mm -hmm. i always like to give them kind of a task to do something to challenge them to go on the next level right so so one of it was it was toilet paper company one of the clients so how can you write an article which is interesting for people to lead uh, to read and at the same time is giving enough information so so it it drives sales as well mm -hmm. like and it was a real challenge you know it needs to be interesting it's toilet paper you know but when you this is the you you gave your team that task to see how they would respond is that what you think yeah, yeah. We, we actually had a client who was producing toilet paper oh right right so, okay. so it was actually the real thing what was the story in the end Oh, it, it has a lot, of, a lot of different nuances and examples and, and actually the story was how can you sell a boring product? You know, that was the article for that company. That's great. You know, so, so that was the, the, the angle that, that they use and it, and it went, that's great. And it went great. But the thing is, and I want to emphasize one thing that you mentioned, it is the importance of knowing how to tell the story because yeah, compare B2C and B2B, B2C is one too many. And, and you go directly to the person, you know, you sell directly in B2B, you sell to the group of people, right? But you know who those people are, you know them by name today, right? So if I know them by name, I can go and I can dig up stories. I can dig up things. Like I remember the first time that I sold something in the services of an agency. When I was the GM, mm -hmm. I needed to start selling and learn how to do that as well. It was. I started the selling process on LinkedIn, but mm -hmm. I finished it, uh, finished it with an information that I got from Twitter. It was that the guy loves fishing. So I needed okay. to learn a couple of things we got into communication about fishing and we end up working together, right? Those kind of things, or, or like I talk about, we talk about basketball, we start recording. I talk about NBA a lot on Twitter. I cursed, I, I curse in Serbian when it, Partisan is playing those kind of things. And, and you know, let me give, give another example. So uh, a potential client reached out to me and he said, I'm following you on Twitter and, uh, you know, I understand your expertise and I want us, you to help us. I've been reading what you are writing for a long time. And, you know, I know exactly what you're doing. And I'm like, not on LinkedIn on Twitter. And he said, yes, mm. I said, I'm sorry. You know, I'm cursing so much. I'm writing a lot of stuff. He was from Serbia, so he understand everything. Mm. But and he told me, you know, if you are not the partisan fan, we wouldn't be talking at all. That was the yeah. entry point, right? <laughs> so, you gotta be careful with that, right? Like, also, some people might, uh, yeah, might might not might not like the team that you uh, that you support. It's funny because I do this. My Twitter is like such a mess of stuff it's just everything out of my brain right like at any given moment i care not about engagement or anything it's like some things feel more twitter and twitter is the first social it's i i only had twitter for a really long time like i think i joined twitter like 2007 i think that's is that possible i'm not even sure if that's possible i, think, yeah, I, I, I think looked it up the other day I looked it up the other day, like it's done i've had the whole time i don't have at the moment i don't have facebook or instagram because i just i can't I just don't want to deal with them, to be perfectly honest. Um, I use them in stealth, so I can still use them for work. But yeah, Twitter, Twitter, my Twitter is like just a, an absolute melange of stuff, mainly my sporting likes as well. So yeah, I can I can relate to that. Whereas my LinkedIn is a little bit more uh, a little bit more focused. Yeah, sounds sounds good. So last two questions. <laughs> First one is, 
what the future brings for you except cool. going to to australia right and the second one is where can people find more information about you what's the best address uh, you mean like email or like uh or, platform or like your LinkedIn, or whatever my LinkedIn is, is the, yeah. the best place to find me. My, my name is Philippe Vela, even though I don't sound like a Philippe, my dad is French and I have a dual nationality. That's why I get to live in Europe. Um, but I think my, my LinkedIn might be uh, Phil Vela. Itro is a uh, I Y T R O dot I O. So that's pretty easy to find. And we have a very funky website. I have to say like uh, your, your funky marketing, but our website is quite funky. Um, so people should definitely go check it out. And what does the future hold? Uh, that's a really interesting question. I'm not at the moment. I've got a few months to work that out. <laughs> I'm going to Australia for a month, and then um, and then and then we'll and then we'll see. I, I'd love to answer that in a million different ways, but I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure I know what to say yet. I will say that like um, this whole thing of um, this thing that I was kind of ranting about with Europe, I think is. Um, is something that that I'd like to kind of work on. I'm not really sure yet in what way. I do think there's there's an opportunity for all of us, like you, you know, me, other people I know, Germany, UK. I really think there's a chance to build like more of a community of people that help the same types of businesses and do it in different ways and make it into something that's more of a cross-border thing. Because <clears throat> I think I know the answer to why those ecosystems don't do it. It's money and it's uh and it's um governments that don't want to kind of like you know they want to have their own piece of the pie that doesn't make any sense for businesses like it really really doesn't make any sense for businesses and so i do think there's an opportunity in the future to build some kind of uh community of people that help uh the businesses that we work with particularly early stage startups grow across border cross cultural cross language cross all of that because i think it's the only way that the uh, that europe will ever kind of reach the level of um the us when it comes to this type of uh, innovation and, and speed of growth Otherwise, we're we're the border and do something else, and it's just it does it's not um it's not scalable. So I think there's a chance to kind of build something from the ground up. Power to the people, my friends. Yeah, that, that's a that's a great ending. I don't have anything to add except, guys, we had a pretty informal conversation, but there are tons of useful stuff in there. So I always say, go back to the beginning of the episode, listen again, stop when you need to think about the things when you need explanation reach out to philip reach out to me and we're always happy to to chat to answer the comments whatever it is connect with philip send him some questions if you have it i always say you know send that you uh, that you are coming after listening to the funky marketing podcast let's see if anybody actually does this one day if it happens i always say at the end only one time go ahead subscribe share this if you liked it please keep it funky that's the only thing that's important philip my man thanks you for being here Cheers, spending brother. like more Take than easy. more than an hour talking with me and the no people problems. and i'm sure we'll do it again definitely i think so man i think we'll do it informally informally actually and say can i ask one more question myself if we go how do we say uh how do we uh, support partisan verbally like how do we say go partisan or whatever how do we do that in serbian uh, oh, we have Samo Napred Partizan, Samo Napred Partizan, Sisa is Vezda. <laughs> I think oh. I know what that means, and I think that's the place to leave. <laughs> Cheers, brother. Exactly. Bye-bye, guys. See you, mate.